departmental global health uh, uh, seminar series. And like Jeremy says, this one's going to be a little different because this is going to be um, done as a meeting rather than a webinar. And like, like he says, anyone who wants to turn on their video, you're welcome to do so. Um, I'm going to have this introduced um, by, by, by David Jones. David is uh, your colleague and the Ackerman Professor of the Culture of Medicine, both here at the medical school and at the college. He is the uh, director of the Arts and Humanities Initiative at HMS. So he is the perfect person to introduce uh, Jeremy and, and Louisa. Well, thank you, Scott, uh, for launching this off and Jeremy for agreeing to do this. Uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce uh, Jeremy, who some of you know, but many of you likely uh, do not. Uh, and I've been working with Jeremy now for about five years and continue to be fascinated uh, by the work that he does and the new things I learned about his work. He trained in medicine, uh, internal medicine at Beth Israel Hospital, uh, and is now officially on the faculty at the Center of Primary Care here in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. But his work has taken him, taken him in many fascinating directions over his career. He has done a lot of work uh, in healthcare management, exploring delivery systems that address concerns with cost and quality. He has advised employers, government agencies, other purchasers on various ways to optimize healthcare delivery, especially the use of technology to manage and coordinate information flow between the many interested groups within healthcare. And that is, has been a large part of his work over his career. I have gotten to know Jeremy in an entirely different way through his work in the arts and humanities. Jeremy is the founder and president of the Foundation for, Heart, for Art and Healing, an organization that explores and promotes the relationship be between creative arts expression and the health and well being of individuals and the community. He has done a whole series of innovative projects, for instance, one project with the Veterans Administration exploring how you could use arts and humanities uh, to assist with and engage in the care of disabled veterans. Most recently, he's been focused on the problems of loneliness and social isolation. Now to Jeremy's credit, he had been working on this problem for several years before the COVID epidemic has focused the world's attention on problems, problems of isolation. And this left him very well positioned to be an influential voice over the past year, as we have all figured out how to cope with this unprecedented degree of isolation uh, over the past year. He has done many different kinds of work on the problem of loneliness. He teaches a course at the Harvard School of Public Health on loneliness and public health. He hosts a series of projects uh, through the Foundation in Art and Healing, including a film festival, uh, which releases a ser series of short films uh, about the problems of loneliness and social isolation. And he has had outreach to countless media venues uh, who have been extremely interested in his work, especially over the past year. PBS, for instance, named him as an influencer in aging for 2020 for the work that they have done in the Stuck at Home Together website, which is a mechanism for connecting people during the early stages of the pandemic. I don't want to go on for too long because I want you to hear from Jeremy, but anyone who's interested should Google him or Google the Foundation for Art and Healing, and you can get much more detail about the variety of projects and innovative things that Jeremy has done at the intersection between art and medicine. And I should also note that he is also a published poet, uh, so definitely a man of many talents. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Jeremy. Yeah, thanks so much, David, and uh, thanks, Scott, for um, kind of setting the stage for the next uh, hour and 24 minutes. We've got booked uh, time together. So I'm Jeremy Nobel. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And I'm joined by my colleague, Louisa Hudson from the Foundation for Art and Healing. We're gonna spend the next hour or so kind of sharing a lot of what we've been up to. Uh, some of it will be audience interactive, as you'll see, multimedia and so on. And then we'll have plenty of times for Q&A and discussion. So um, I'll just invite again, since a lot of this conversation is around connection, to turn on your cameras if you can. It, you know, Zoom is a very unusual environment for connecting in, in any way. And, you know, these Zoom meetings and so on um, actually do better if we can see each other. And I realize for technology reasons or other reasons, you may not all be able to do that, but I'd invite you to turn on your cameras. And so let's get started. I'll invite um, Louisa to um, share her screen and we'll kind of begin to use a few uh, video tools and uh, get started. So this is what we're here to discuss today, creativity, connection, and health. And we're gonna unpack each of these. We'll have an agenda in a minute. And 
um, as David mentioned, it is a lot of this work will be, you know, describing some of the activities I do through the Foundation for Art and Healing, but it's been increasingly part of my Harvard work, both at the public health school, where I teach, of course, on loneliness and public health, but also at the Center for Primary Care, where we're thinking about how to approach loneliness as an aspect of care in advanced primary care models. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So Louisa, why don't we go to the next slide? So David covered a lot of these elements, but I just wanted to, uh, and mentioned the poetry, but I thought I'd also share that I couldn't get through my day without coffee. Next slide. So these are the three ideas we'll cover today. And uh, first, that loneliness and social disconnection, I think, is this century's and uh, invisible epidemic. Much more visibility now, of course. Um, and that partnering with, with that idea is the second idea that fostering social connection as a social determinant of health is an important and timely opportunity. I'll share more on that. But then we'll really be focusing mostly on this not so new idea that creative arts expression enables a kind of connection in some interesting ways that we, we believe can improve health and well being. And particularly when we get to the discussion part of today's time together, I'm eager to hear the thoughts of everyone about um, how creativity may be useful as they think about ways we address health and well being. So those are the ideas. We're gonna get started with a little bit of interaction with some polling questions and I'll turn it over to Carol uh, to guide us through the polling. For those of you who haven't been on polls, you just see the questions in front of you, you click in and we'll do them one by one, a few seconds on each. You don't have to overthink it. Wow, great, 90% voted, <laughs> even that is an accomplishment. Okay, well, pretty, pretty, long, pretty connected crowd here um, compared to where the country's uh, doing pretty much. So um, maybe next polling question. Jeremy, I'm not, I'm not sure that we can see the polling results. Oh, um, Carol, did they display when, when we're all done? Okay, so you, that's that problem. thank you, that, we, that, that should have solved the problem. So 59% lonely some of the time, 40% hardly ever. Next slide or next poll. Okay. I'm gonna try this. Okay, Let's see if I can get the next one. So now we're looking at over the last year. That may be the same question. Ah, okay. It, it does yeah. look like the same question. We can go to, we can, yeah, we can skip so, that and go to the next. Welcome to the um, Zoom experience. <laughs> there we go. Okay, great question. If you were lonely, would you feel comfortable talking about it? Great. Want to share those results, Carol? So it's great that the great that forty percent feel comfortable. The other forty percent not sure. Maybe you'll feel different after today's talk. <laughs> Let's go to the next question. One moment. <laughs> Easier said than done. Here, there sure. you go. Okay. If you were lonely, do you know what to do about it? Okay, almost all in here. So great. Two thirds of you feel very confident about that. That's terrific. For those who aren't sure, again, hopefully a little more sure when we're done today. 
And I think one more question. One if you were lonely, <laughs> oh no, that's the there same question. Extra credit. Extra credit go. question. Do you know the difference between lonely, being lonely and being alone? So this is active, once you show the results, Carol, this is remarkable because I used to ask these questions about a year ago, actually about a year and a half ago, and it was a 50-50 split. A lot of people not sure. And now I'm happy to say loneliness literacy in the country seems to have expanded dramatically. Okay, so now we know a little bit about each other and about as a group, you know, obviously loneliness is on people's minds. People do feel, um, the majority feel confident. They know what it is, how to navigate it uh, towards some relief and so on. Why don't we go on to the next slide? So for this audience, since 100% knows about loneliness literacy, this may be redundant. Loneliness is, corresponds to the discrepancy between the desired and social relations. So it's a trick question I often start a class out with, is this person on this bicycle kind of lonely or not? And the answer is you can't tell. So um, then the question is, how do we make sense of all of this? This subjective kind of feeling, uh, very different than being alone or being isolated. Next slide. So loneliness is long, and social isolation has long been categorized as one of the classic social determinants of health. It's here in a kind of usual way that this is described, you know, that 20% of, of health is related to healthcare delivery, 80% to health behaviors, physical environment, socioeconomic factors. You know, so I think loneliness and social support is getting increased attention. And I think in part because of its resonance with the health behaviors. And so if you add the percent of 40 and the, to the, um, no, the, the kind of undeniable influence of loneliness on things like alcohol use, tobacco use, and so forth, you begin to see that maybe there's a lot more here around loneliness than just characterizing it in a very narrow way. We'll unpack that a little bit more as we go through uh, the talk today. Next slide, please. And then anchoring this in some very traditional public health framing, uh, life expectancy, uh, many people are aware of the work by Angus Deaton. He got the Nobel Prize for identifying a subset of the population, um, non-Hispanic whites aged 45 to 54, who even before the pandemic, uh, their, their uh, premature deaths because of suicide, drug overdose, alcohol-related liver disease, and so on, was actually causing life expectancy in the US to go down. Now we can thank the pandemic for that. On average, life expectancy will go down one year. Uh, for um, uh, Hispanics, it's two years. For Black Americans, three years. So uh, hard to figure out what part of, of this is all loneliness, but certainly even before the pandemic, loneliness was having a major impact on some key public health parameters. Next slide. So why does loneliness matter? You know, so I think the the, the majority of the attention focuses on the mental health aspects of loneliness, no question. It can be considered one of the biggest preventable risk factors for this classic triad of mental health concerns, uh, depression, addiction, suicidality. It obviously also contributes to anxiety, but, but even beyond the mental health issues, I think there's growing awareness, I'll pack this a little bit more in a minute, of the, the burden of uh, loneliness on cardiovascular health, metabolic and immunologic health, and actually taken together, that has a significant impact on um, life expectancy. But lastly, the burden of uh, loneliness on social health, how we engage, how we collaborate, how we flourish. And I think there's growing realization um, that actually these social health parameters are interoperable with mental and physical health parameters. I'll try to explore that a little bit at the neurophysiologic level later in this talk. But so this is loneliness and here's why it matters. Since it's so surprising, the physical um, impact, I thought I'd share some work by a colleague. Next slide, Louisa. Um, Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstedt did some really intriguing uh, epidemiologic meta analysis starting around 2012, 2013. And at first, people um, really didn't know what to make of it. It's, all, it's been repeated, it's, been, it's kind of accepted that loneliness won't just make you miserable, it will kill you. 
and I won't unpack this very busy slide totally, but I just the length of the bar here is bad, right? So the longer the bar, the greater the risk of, of early mortality. And you can see where smoking, alcohol consumption, physical activity, and obesity, classic public health concerns, how they rank against social connection at ha as not having the level of uh, negative impact on, on, uh, on longevity. And I think this has actually helped you know, kind of focus attention on loneliness for many people. Next slide, with what's become a little bit of a meme soundbite that, um, you know, loneliness can be as lethal as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. You can, as I think folks of you uh, in the audience who do a lot of communication around health matters, you know, you, you can describe things for a while with people with graphs and charts and numbers, but, you know, when you can get it really powerfully aligned with a metaphor, like as, you know, as, smoking 15 cigarettes a day, people start to react differently. And that opens up some really great possibilities for change. So let's kind of turn to where loneliness has an impact on our lives. So first the workplace. So Vivek Murthy, uh, former Surgeon General, now Surgeon General again, published this article in Harvard Business Review, I think around 2017 in the fall. This kind of helped get the conversation started about workplace and, um, and the loneliness epidemic even before COVID and so forth. Now, you know, it was just signaling, not that work makes people lonely necessarily, although there are toxic workplaces, it's that we bring our loneliness to work and that it, the workplace represents an opportunity to intervene on loneliness. But it also can be a place where loneliness gets exacerbated. And this is happening everywhere now. And let's go to the next slide. And it's a particular cycle between stress burnout, which is not just more stress, but it's, it is more stress, but it also is a kind of sense of depersonalization, a sense of personal inadequacy in getting your work done. And this moves to more loneliness and isolation, which then um, people withdraw, they're removed from the support of family, friends, and colleagues, and then it allows them uh, to be more susceptible, less resilient to stress. And so you imagine you get this really regrettable um, feed forward cycle. So that's stress in the modern workplace and leading to burnout, leading to isolation. We made some effort to measure this burden. Uh, next slide. I'll talk you through a little study we did with a major financial services firm. This again was pre-COVID. So uh, many of you may be aware that uh, many large employers do annual risk surveys where they ask their employees you know, questions uh, related to their health, sometimes called the health risk assessment. So we took the, the subscale of the UCLA loneliness scale and we took these three questions that actually are scored by points. So how often do you feel isolated from others in your life? How often do you feel you lack companionship? How often do you feel left out in your life? And they can be scored with one, two or three points. You can then sum these scores and come up with a loneliness score that then allows you to look at the impact of loneliness on other important parameters. So the next slide looks at a major <laughs> area of impact interest for employers, how much are they spending for healthcare? And we were able to determine that the loneliness population, the lonely population was 22% more expensive. And that was both on the medical cost, but also the, phar the pharmaceutical cost. So lonely people cost 22% more than those who are not lonely. But if you drill deeper into the kinds of care lonely people re you know, require compared to non-lonely, it gets even more interesting. Next slide, please. So if you look at hospital admissions, it turns out that the number of acute admissions per thousand is pretty similar between the lonely and the unlonely, but the avoidable admissions and the readmission rates are twice as high. So is that because people who are lonely are more uh, likely to have um, inadequate social, socially related health behaviors, post-admission, pre-admission, more fragile, less medication adherence, uh, don't go to the physician or the care team early enough to avoid hospitalization. Not clear, but what is clear is that there's a clear difference in how lonely and uh, non-lonely people um, interact with avoidable hospitalization. Next slide, gets even more interesting, I think. If you look at opioid use in a population, as we did with this, the 15,000 people in this financial services firm, the patients per thousand um, who use a, a prescription opioid is about the same, same number of people, but the number of patients with a, an opioid use disorder is three times higher in the lonely population. So this got a lot of attention. And lastly, as you might imagine, people who are lonely um, might have less uh, collaborative capabilities, corporate citizenship, next slide. So if you look at 
um, productivity in the workplace, and again, I won't unpack this very busy slide, you see that people who are hardly ever isolated, left out, or lack companionship have a certain baseline of 36 hours lost in productivity. That's the column to the right. If they reported that they were sometimes um, isolated or left out, it was about twice the lost hours. And then if they felt often um, isolated, left out, it was four, three to four times that lost productivity. And the calculation took this into um, a few million dollars, enough to potentially fund uh, a connection and, and kind of social cohesion program in this employer. So that's kind of by the numbers, um, you know, on the workplace. What's happening now with COVID in the workplace? Next slide, Louisa. You know, so no surprise, the continued uncertainty, sense of vulnerability has increased stress, burnout, and loneliness. There's evidence that there's clear uh, increase in anxiety disorders, particularly around younger employees, where the CDC does a weekly pulse survey. Some of you may know this, and it's reporting rates um, uh, in the uh, cohort between 18 and 28 of anxiety and depression combined of symptomatology, not necessarily diagnosis, of 58%. So there's a lot, whatever is going on, it's going on a lot in the workplace, particularly in high risk populations. And that leads obviously, you know, to significant increased risk for addiction, um, suicide. The other piece of the health impact, which is a primary care physician, I think is probably more on my radar is while the primary in, in, impact may be on mental health because it changes behavior, there is an abandonment of self-care for other chronic conditions like cardiovascular disease, um, you know, GI disease, neurologic disease, leading to you know, spiraling, um, worsening of those disease states. So it all kind of packages in to what I think could clearly be viewed as a problem. So that's the workplace. And that's an area we can talk more about in the Q&A. We're doing quite a bit there. Um, now let's talk at some of the other, look at some of the other populations that might be at risk. Next slide, Louisa. So older adults, as David mentioned, we did a lot to ramp up some support activities early on in the pandemic uh, to support older adults. A lot of that funded by AARP Foundation. Um, they also funded some of our community work that Louisa runs and we'll describe later. Um, but aging amplifies loneliness effects. There are more frequent stressful events in aging, biological and behavioral dysfunction, negative social cognition, sometimes this is called being grumpy, um, and influences on brain and activity. You know, so um, mild cognitive impairment. All of this kind of exacerbates the, lonely, the, the impact of loneliness. Um, next slide. Relevant to this audience, loneliness is increasing on campus. You know, we do work uh, with campuses around the country, you know, around loneliness going on right now. As I mentioned, anxiety and depression levels, symptomatologies are in the 60 plus percent for these, this vulnerable population. It also interacts with another feature of loneliness, which is belonging, which is not exactly like general connection, but it's very, it's connection to a, a place, a group or an idea. And that seems to be deteriorating uh, in, the, in the COVID sense. A lot of it because of distance learning, altered rituals, altered um, routines and altered boundaries. So the campus is having a hard time. Next slide. And cutting across all of the populations is the, the burden of loneliness on caregivers. I'm not gonna go too deeply into this, but I, you know, it's been an area of great interest for me. I know it's shared by others um, you know, on our faculty. And, um, thinking about the impact of loneliness and isolation on someone who's already marginalized and ex often exhausted because of the uh, physical burden and the logistical burden of caregiving, um, to add to that, the, you know, the, the burden on uh, emotions um, is you know, something we really you know, need to pay more, more careful attention to and support caregivers in all the ways that we may be positioned to, but I think maybe lagging a bit behind. We can talk more about that in Q&A also. So to sum it up, next slide, Louisa. So what's next? So loneliness, diverse group of individuals and circumstance, a set of complex and overlapping drivers and concern. And so as you imagine, no silver bullet. So I'm certainly not suggesting that creative arts expression is the silver bullet that will um, def, you know, kind of allow us to flawlessly navigate loneliness and its health burdens. Next slide, Louisa. But I think there's more to it than many people imagine. 
we often think about creative arts as something that happens kind of on the margin. It could, you know, it happens for entertainment or distraction or enjoyment. All of the, these are fine, but I think it's more fundamental than that. And in trying to describe it, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about other aspects of the arts and how they connect. I love this quote by Tony Kushner. You may know him. He's a playwright. He did Angels in America, an early play describing uh, the AIDS the AIDS crisis. You know, it's come back to Broadway just before COVID to sell out crowds, even before COVID. So there's something in this work that has to do with vulnerability and connection. So I, I love this quote. I think that people do go to art in general as a way of addressing very deep, very intimate, very mercurial and elusive, ineffable things in a communal setting. It ends a certain kind of inner loneliness. This is the part I think is really important. Or it joins one's own inner loneliness with the inner loneliness of many other people. And I think that can be healing. All I'll say to this is I don't think we cure loneliness the way we might cure pneumonia. I think the best we do is learn to navigate it. But I think that actually can be incredibly helpful and uh, both life affirming and health affirming for many people. And we'll share more of that. But let's look a little bit at you know, the arts over the years and, and why it might be as helpful for us as I believe it is. So, you know, it starts by just kind of asking ourselves the question, why has there never been a culture without art? And maybe because it helps us to connect and maybe that connection helps us to survive and is preserved both physiologically, you know, Darwinian selection, but also uh, it's preserved culturally. You know, so these are a few well-known cave paintings. The one from Altamira, Spain, is about 15,000 years old. Um, Picasso said, you know, he thought it was some of the best painting of all time. Um, the other, the one to the right was just discovered a few years ago in Indonesia, and it's 45,000 years old. And it's the oldest representational uh, cave drawings. There are earlier cave markings that, you know, are often categorized, go back to 70,000 years. But this is a picture of a wild boar you know, that someone, some artist took the trouble of recording on a cave wall. So hard to know exactly why that it happened, but it did happen. Provocative, and I think sets the stage for what else could be going on. And we think a big part of what's going on is in the brain. Next slide. So here's an underlying principle, I think, of why the arts can improve health and well-being is they, the creative arts literally rewire our brain. Now you can argue, oh, that's kind of, not a big observation, everything we interact with um, rewires our brain. And in a sense, that's true. But I think the arts do it in some very specific, powerful and reinforceable ways. And that impacts our health. So next slide. Again, just a reminder of how powerful brain activity is in relating the physiologic with the behavioral. How our brains work changes how we behave. How we behave changes how our brains work. So whether it's neuroendocrine outflow, you know, which is you know, really kind of the main driver there is cortisol, glucocorticoid, stress-related uh, fight or flight symptomatology, autonomic auto, uh, outflow, also um, fight or flight, or neuropeptide out, outflow, mediating mood and motivation. All of these are powerful interoperators that actually is, you know, deliver to us our sense of the world. And it's our sense of the world that delivers to us how we act. So next slide, a little, little cartoon here you know, about, you know, physiologic and behavioral, you know, oxytocin, the so-called feel-good hormone, opens up our sense of connection, empathy, and compassion to others. We exchange, it increases um, oxytocin levels, and we feel more connected. So again, something to take to scale if we think this is worth exploring. Next slide. Again, still on the scientific basis of this. So um, many of you may know Harlan Krumholtz. He spent his time at the, uh, in the Longwood area. He was a, a resident at Beth Israel Hospital also. And he's now at Yale, he's a cardiologist. And we worked with Harlan on a, a pretty major convening called Arts in the Heart about 10 years ago. And, and he made this statement when the evidentiary base was pretty low. I'll get back to that in a minute. If we can demonstrate that emotion affects outcomes and art affects emotion, then a logical path to better outcomes would involve more attention to engaging people in artistic pursuits. So I said, fantastic, Harlan, we're gonna go do that. So like I said, this is, this is um, 2010. And so we began to do some, some work talk, looking at arts and I'm gonna share some of that work with you um, in, a, uh, in a two minute video. So um, let's go to the next slide. 
And as we tee up that video, I'll just give you a little bit of background. We were doing work, as uh, David mentioned, with the VA and then also with the Department of Defense with active duty military, looking at, the, at PTSD, a you know, classic anxiety disorder in, as a result of military-related trauma. And I did the interview uh, with, the, the, with Captain Berner that you're about to see. And I was just so struck by how much insight he had into the power of creative expression and as well as his initial skepticism about it and leading to his embrace of it. So I thought I'd share it, share it with you folks really almost as a piece of field evidence about the power of creative expression. You wanna run the video, um, Louisa? Captain Jason Berner, combat engineer. I've been in the Marine Corps 15 years. I lost three Marines due to IEDs. I uh, lost several of my friends uh, on one deployment. And having the experience of having stood on an IED that didn't detonate, but killed one of my Marines a little bit later. Um, here I am, a strong, physically demanding warrior. Why do I have to do art? I, I plan battles, I plan wars. I take life if necessary, if, if absolute necessary. I'm not doing art. But each time I did something with uh, art therapy, I felt better because there was something in me that was dying to get out. And through art, I was able to express it. So I made a crest. And it represented all those people I've been protecting my entire life. My mother, my little brother, from my father and his alcoholism and dependencies, um, the country as a whole, and my combat deployments. And that shield gets beat up. And, you know, it takes a lot of blows. But if the shield does its job, the person wielding it is successful. The thing I liked about the mask is represented many different levels of, of who I viewed myself. When I was weak, emotionally and psych psychologically, I was able to project a strong front. I would have never had talked about what this meant. I was shielded in some ways. I was protected. I was able to express it in a way that was safe for me through simple things, able to create something that, that makes it okay to feel the way I feel and help take those, that burden away. Yeah, so for those of you in the group who do field work and anthro anthropologic work, you know that this is the kind of evidence that, that really kind of makes you think what, what's going on and, ha and how do we get further into knowing, you know, how the power that of creative expression obviously is very helpful for Captain Berner, maybe harnessed to help others. Next slide. Now, what's been really great since the conversation, the quote from Harlan 10 years ago is the evidentiary base around creative expression, health and well-being has not only grown dramatically, but it's been very well summarized. And this report came out, uh, it's a scoping review that's the health evidence for um, you know, creative expression, health and well-being. World Health Organization, you know, 600 references. It was done by Daisy Fancourt and some others. It's available for free download. You know, the links here. Um, and I would urge you, if you're curious about what, what is the science behind arts and health, I, I would dig in into you know, what's in that report. In the next slide, I'll summarize some of the key findings. You know, and it really um, was building on, on assumptions that were already there. First of all, the arts are very powerful in assisting in recovery from trauma. Lots more we can talk about why that may be true in the Q&A if there's interest. It also increases understanding of oneself and others leads to increase in compassion, empathy, and so on. And that is at the same time linked to this increased capacity for self-reflection. Can you be better connected to yourself? And I believe that actually may be very instrumental in being connected to others. Um, clearly reduces disease burden and symptomatology, everything from you know uh, hypertension to um, uh, other forms, both the risk factor and physiology. Very importantly, it changes behaviors and thinking patterns. And if you go back to that slide about the relationship between physiology and behavior, you can see where that goes. And then fosters a sense of connection to self and others, which if you're trying to deal with a loneliness epidemic, I think represents some very important um, opportunities. But what do we mean when we say arts and health and do art and enjoy art? So I'm gonna to try to unpack that a little bit for you, next slide. 
So in our work, we've kind of looked at three parallel ways that creative expression can improve health. And for those in the audience who are makers, whether you make poems or make music or make movements, um, maybe this will relate. The, the first way that creative expression improves health is just being in the moment of the making of the art itself. And I believe that is a very privileged moment uh, in modern society when we're continuously distracted, allowing us to be as present as we can be with thoughts and feelings. But then next, next um, piece of the triptych, to capture those in some artifact that can be used to share it with other people. And so your own explorations, your hypotheses, your curiosity then becomes uh, an artifact that actually invites you to be in dialogue, to be in conversation with others. And then the last slide, it also allows them to be in conversation with you and with the art and their own thoughts and feelings. And so, you know, that allows almost an electric circuit to be connected between the art maker and the art receiver. And in our programming that Louisa will walk you through in a bit, uh, we put all of these activities to work, just baked into the, baked into the programming. So next slide. Now, what is it about the arts? Do all the arts work? Well, it turns out the big four, music, visual arts, language arts, and dance, where a lot of the research has been. But we've seen tremendous benefit from what I call the big three, <laughs> which is what people do, you know, in, in their culinary arts, textile arts, sewing, knitting, and so on, parts of culture for thousands of years. And then don't want to forget gardening, which a friend of mine often refers to as the world's slowest performance art. You know, you put the seeds in the ground, you watch it grows and you become delighted by the artifact you've created. So those are the arts. Now, how do we make better use of the arts in programming? We're gonna to turn to that direction. One very intriguing thing is, uh, next slide please, um, is um, captured sometimes through social prescribing. So for those who don't know what social prescribing is, it's kind of about a 10 or 12 year history got started in the UK, it, was, it starts by asking patients, you typically in a primary care model, you know, are you lonely or isolated? If they say yes, you, know, you, you investigate a little further and you invite them to meet with someone and who might help them navigate through some choices. So one of the choices that uh, got tested out in uh, Montreal was a very special prescription blank that the primary care physicians had uh, where they could actually prescribe a visit to the art museum for up to four people. So it's not just you, but you get to take your family, take friends. And so, you know, take two Picasso, see me in the morning starts becoming a recognition that the arts and the social engagement around the arts can be taken seriously as part of a primary care model. We're trying to figure out how do we can explore this at the Center for Primary Care. It's, it's well underway and embraced by the National Health Service at this point in the UK. And I think just an example, of how we don't have to invent new models uh, of creative arts expression and health. Maybe we just have to get a little more creative about how to insert certain models into other structures like advanced primary care um, that we already have. And we'll talk more about that on the programming side. Okay, so a quick kind of update of where we are so far, right? So we've talked about loneliness, social isolation as a public health concern. We've talked about creative arts and what we can offer. We're going to go into like the third and final part of you know what Luisa and I have put together for you, which is basically a case study on what we're doing uh, to address loneliness and isolation through the Unlonely Project. So the Unlonely Project is the project. It's not its own organization. It's the signature initiative of the Foundation for Art and Healing that David mentioned that I have the pleasure of, of leading. Um, and uh, it has a threefold goal. First is to increase awareness of loneliness and its toxicities. The second is to reduce stigma around it. And the third is to design and deploy programming that could actually foster social connection using the arts. Now, next slide. Now we don't use just the arts as you'll hear. We put other modalities like mindfulness, social emotional uh, learning models together. But there is something unique about the arts. I think the first thing is the unbelievable power of the arts to engage us. Right at a time of, of distraction, you know, you just see a, 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 everything from a billboard to a, a music video and you just turn your attention to it. So totally engaging. Um, and it gives people a chance once engaged to not only see the expressions of others, express their own, um, their own thoughts and feelings creatively, but to then become activated to think more about the world, to act in different ways in the world. And we'll share 
some of some of those results from our um, our fall pilots with you, and then and through that activation and new way to make sense of the world to feel more connected to yourself and others and through that to have a greater sense of well being, and that's really what um, what we're shooting for, and. Um, so we go about that in a couple of ways at the Unlonely Project, and we're going to give you a little sampling of one fun way. So one fun way is through the power of short films. So we're now in the fourth year of what David mentioned, our short film festival. It's called the Unlonely Film Festival. It's a festival that goes on a whole year. It's actually kind of a little bit of a Trojan horse. What's really going on, it's a digital you know, population health improvement, engagement and improvement platform. We don't, want, we don't market it that way. We call it the Unlonely Film Festival. It's a lot more appealing. And we encourage people to come and see these short films on loneliness, one of which um, I'll share with you in a minute, as a way to kind of not only give them more sense about what loneliness is, maybe stir up their own feelings, but when watched with other people uh, and then talked about, can foster a sense of connection around the theme uh, of, of the need and importance of connection. And it's up and running now. We gather sponsorship dollars, so there's no paywall. It's at unlonelyfilms.org. So come see the films, but don't do it right now because you're watching our webinar. So I thought, why don't we give you a little sample? So I did mention caregiving. This is a, a very short animation that really unpacks um, what's sometimes called um, you know, caregiver burnout or compassion fatigue. Uh, I won't say more to it than that, but I'll invite you to um, watch along with you with us for the next two minutes as we um, as we go on this little animated tour. So, Louisa? Thanks, Louisa. So, I mean, imagine, you know, you know, if we had more time, we could unpack and, you know, to, well, what'd you see? What was interesting? How'd you relate to this? And, but just imagine, if you will, watching that small film, if you're, you know, with, you know, you're in college with some peers, if you're uh, in a workplace or even with family, you know, just saying, wow, wasn't that interesting, you know, and, and talk about compassion fatigue. I mean, very, very important in healthcare delivery settings, as you know. So that's just an example of how, you know, just watching a film itself may make you more sensitive to loneliness, but it also invites you into conversation around it, which can be very, very connected. So we thought we'd just give you a little taste of that. But we also wanted to share with you what we're doing on the program side. So, um, you know, many of you on this call have been developing and you run programs, you design and evaluate programs. So some of this is familiar territory. This work got started about 10 years ago with funding from Blue Cross, Blue, Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Foundation to look at um, behavioral aspects in diabetes and particularly in subpopulations uh, of diabetes who seem to be struggling maintaining di diabetes control. So we did this basically a support group model with about a dozen uh, black women, middle-aged, low income with diabetes, A1Cs over nine. So by definition, not well controlled. And we're able to show by you know, some intervention work, significant improvements in just six sessions. So um, that kind of emboldened us to think about how we could 
uh, and we used creative expression uh, modalities as part of the support work. It emboldened us to start thinking about, could we develop some real programming around this? Next slide. And for those of you, again, in programming, understand that there, there are components of programs. You have to attract people, engage them, activate them, support them, and connect them. And so what the creative arts, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't magically do this. It becomes a bit of a catalyst, right? To get people excited, to get them to tolerate the discomfort of disclosure, for instance, when they're in discussions, and ultimately to achieve, you know, kind of this round trip of, of a sense of, uh, of connection through that disclosure, through connection with others. And as I said, we'll, we'll share that with you. So that's kind of the program model, which we think is innovative in its own right. We also have a distribution model, which we think is innovative, which is to partner with community-based organizations to get these programs out there uh, using a digital distribution platform. Next slide. And I'll set the stage here for the actual pilot that Louisa will describe. So we have these programs and curriculum, there are community-based organizations out there and they're vulnerable populations. The key is to get the right, right program, right place, right time and so forth. And then you can get acceleration of you know, outreach in a public health model. What struck us is how varied the types of community-based organizations are that really are in position to serve the needs of their sub-communities with programming that could foster a sense of social connection and cohesion. So next slide, we'll just show you some examples. You know, so yes, healthcare centers, the work we did in diabetes was, was with Boston Medical Center and their outpatient center, but within social service outreach agencies, you know, um, area agencies on aging, housing groups, schools, workplaces, and places of worship. So plenty of community-based organizations. And so that's kind of how we set the stage. So with that stage set, we were, we, um, were launching um, a pilot to reach out to older adults. I'll turn, and then, then the pandemic happened, made us, forced us to get a little bit nimble, a little creative ourselves. So I'll turn it over to um, Louisa. It's one of our programming managers at the Foundation for Art and Healing um, to uh, kind of walk us through what that pilot looked like and the very encouraging results uh, we received. Over to you, Louisa. Thanks, Jeremy, and hi, everyone. Some of you may recognize me from when I worked uh, in the department uh, last year, actually. Um, so nice to see some familiar faces. Um, yes, yeah, so today I will be talking about um, our successful aging creativity circles pilot and particularly our um, fall 2020 results. Okay, so um, for this pilot, um, we had nine participating sites. So some examples of those, as Jeremy mentioned, community-based organizations, um, naturally occurring uh, retirement centers and health delivery systems. So there were 102 participants in total for this pilot, uh, the age range 50 to 101 years old uh, across these three geographic areas. And as you can see from this um, screenshot here, uh, this was a virtual program uh, done over Zoom. Uh, and of course, that was because of the pandemic at this time. But, you know, one benefit to that was that we were able to reach, you know, such a variety of people as with, um, with Zoom, you can um, reach more rural populations or those with mob any mobility concerns. So, um, oh, sorry, yes, and that screenshot was actually from one of our um, uh, pilot sites, uh, Bangor YMCA in Bangor, Maine. Um, and so the curriculum, so the curriculum is designed really to be facilitated uh, by almost anyone. The only requirement that we suggest to uh, uh, partner sites when they're recruiting their facilitators is that they, uh, the facilitator is comfortable, um, uh, of course, working with older adults, uh, working with creative materials, and maybe some uh, group facilitation experience as well. And that is really just for the purpose of scalability. So each session, as you can see, there are eight sessions, and each of these sessions is really scripted and there's plenty of materials um, that I'll get into a little bit uh, in the next slide. Um, that really gives them everything they need to successfully facilitate a session. So each of these sessions are uh, themed on a different topic related to aging. So for example, we have one on brain health, there's one on, um, on legacy. And the key benefit of each session and each activity within the session is primarily social connection and of course fun. Um, 
So uh, one example of the uh, of one of the sessions that we hold, it's actually focused on the pandemic um, and the participants work with clay. And just anecdotally, we had a really nice feedback from one of the participants that noted that working with this new material on the field of clay um, was really uh, beneficial to him in reflecting on his recent experience of uh, becoming a widower. Um, and so you'll see here that the three key components of each session, we have mindfulness, social and emotional learning, and of course, a creative activity. So the mindfulness activities that we incorporate into each session really serve the purpose to help participants feel open and sharing and to prepare them for the creative, the creative activity um, in the session. And the creative activity, it is designed for all levels. So, you know, we may have, we have some uh, participants, you know, really identify as artists themselves and have been either painting or writing for, for many years, but we also have participants that might not have, you know, picked up um, even paint or something like that since they were in school. So they're very much designed to involve everyone. And as I mentioned earlier, the key point of this being the social connection and fun, exploring the materials, using the materials um, and the creative activity as kind of a new language, as a way to communicate with each other and uh, to connect with each other. Okay, so the program implementation. So as I mentioned, the, we had um, 14 facilitators. So a couple of sites had more than one facilitator, but for the most part, it is one facilitator. Uh, per group of about eight to 12 participants. And the facilitators, uh, this was all done virtually. So the facilitators were virtually trained via Zoom. Uh, we did a demo session for them so they could really see sort of a, uh, how a session would flow. Um, we did platform training for our online platform that you see this screenshot from here um, and uh, some training on Zoom as well. And along with that, just throughout the program, regular check-ins and support via email and phone from, from us and uh, as well as a midpoint check-in as well, which is an opportunity for them to ask any questions or to provide any feedback. So this online platform also is, you know, another um, part of our plan for scalability, which is that all of the materials can be shared easily with facilitators and partner sites and everything that they need is in this one place uh, where they can access uh, just everything from training videos um, to the session scripts uh, to run a session successfully. And we also have added this uh, component of a facilitator forum, uh, which they can sort of form a community amongst themselves, share tips, ask questions, and communicate with us as well. Uh, another component of the implementation is the introductory calls. So along with the eight sessions, before those eight sessions start, we really wanted to you know, make things as easy as possible for the participants and facilitators given the virtual environment. Uh, and so we wanted to be sure participants were comfortable with the program as well as comfortable using the Zoom functions, which we kept them pretty simple. So, you know, but using them creatively to foster the social connection. So for example, the chat function, participants are encouraged to send words of encouragement to each other and breakout rooms as well. We, we use those in the sessions. Um, so that introductory call is to get participants comfortable with that aspect and also a time um, for them to complete the consent form and the pre-survey, which is part of our evaluation process. And one thing I'll just note about Zoom is that we, we really did see some really good success with um, our participants using Zoom. And actually, an, an anecdote from one of our uh, facilitators was that um, uh, our participant, who is 101 years old, now has weekly calls with her sister um, on Zoom, which is fantastic. Yeah. So and so the evaluation process. So um, all of these surveys were online surveys. So the participants had these three surveys to complete. The pre and post have been completed, and I'll go into those results um, on the next slide. And the three month durability is to come. Um, and the facilitator surveys also all online and um, the facilitators would help the participants complete these. So each time a participant did a, um, a survey, they would be doing this uh, via a Zoom call with the facilitator to make sure they had the support that they needed. Okay, so our findings here. So the preliminary results, uh, they're from our pre and post evaluation surveys for the participants. Uh, so we did see some, uh, you know, really positive changes in participant attitudes, which you can see here. 
And um, what I really want to highlight is this increased activation and changes in behaviors, which is, you know, the results that we're most excited to see. And I'll go into a lot more detail on the next slide. Okay, so this uh, important finding of the activation in the community, and you can see uh, from this slide that you know, a lot of the participants have joined new programs or more programs uh, since the our program has finished. So that was in January, the program finished. And um, one of the things I really love to hear from uh, one of our participants that I actually spoke with yesterday, um, she said that this, this, uh, the creativity circles had really eliminated this fear that she had of joining in new groups and new programs. And that now she is joining all these, all these different activities. Um, she does mindfulness sessions with her daughter every morning. She paints with her granddaughter regularly. Um, and she joined an online um, belly dancing class as well. Um, and she said that she's really encouraging uh, her friends and family to get involved in um, other groups as well. So um, that was really encouraging to hear. And we've heard plenty of other stories of other people. And another one I can think of is a woman who you know, had no Zoom experience before, and she actually has started her own book club on Zoom as well. Okay, so I will just leave you on this slide of the participant testimonials and I'll just point out my personal favorite here, which is that one participant pointed out to us that really um, for them it was creative in and of itself to realize how wonderful you are. So I just think that's lovely and for me the best part about this kind of work is hearing the impact it has on others. So thank you all and uh, back to you Jeremy. Yeah, thanks, Louis. Keep this up here. I, I, I know that some, re, read out some of the ones that you, I know we've talked about this. I think really in field work like this, testimonials often far exceed the ability of surveys to really get to the heart of the matter. Are there one or two that really jump out for you? Yeah, of course. I think the bottom one, it formed a community, which was really our goal of, of this program um, yeah, to have these connections be formed. And um, just to sort of add to that, we have heard from um, you know, plenty of facilitators and participants that they're staying in touch after this. And actually we did, um, you know, in order to allow for people to more formally stay in touch and continue these creative uh, activities, if they, if they chose to, we did create an extension to this program, which is called the Creativity Club. And it is actually, you know, participant led. Um, it's in a very similar format to the creative uh, circles. Uh, so they're familiar with the mindfulness activities and the, the structure of the creative activities and the discussion. And so we have uh, five groups at this time that are actually piloting that for the, for the first time. Right, great. You know, so when we get to the Q&A, it just happens that actually uh, some of our sites are actually with us. So we might put them on the spot during the Q&A to share their own experience uh, with this. So thank you, Luis. They're really uh, terrifically well done and gives us a lot to talk about during the Q&A, which is just about two minutes away. So, so where do we go with all of this? So a big part of my work, as uh, David mentioned, actually is looking at creating more sustainability and quality in healthcare, so-called triple aim, you know, better, better care, uh, better health, lower costs. And we are very intrigued at the path to sustainability for some of these community-based operations. You know, it's one thing to get these incredible community organizations, which we're honored to partner with to do the great work they do in the community, but that costs money. We were able, because we raised some grant money um, to deal with this, you know, to you know, defray some of their expenses, but where does it go when we want tens or hundreds of thousands of community-based organizations around the country to be doing similar activation programs to foster connection? So um, next slide, Louisa. So we think the answer to this really is in the payment models, some of the newer payment models that uh, there are people on this call far more expert on it than I am, but so Medicare Advantage is one of those payment models where there's a total cost of care payment to some risk holder, often a, um, a health system, but sometimes a health plan. Um, and we think that really is an intriguing operation because if we can demonstrate that full engagement in programming leads to changes in pro-social behavior that then become pro-health behaviors and people are more medication adherent, they're more diet and exercise adherent, they seek the medical care from their care team when they need it in a timely way. 
I am quite confident that we can measure a reduction in ED visits per thousand, emergency department visits per thousand, total, total um, bed days per thousand. And in that economic margin that's created, all I can say is it buys a lot of art supplies. <laughs> just a single avoided uh, emergency room visit. And, you know, it's hope something that we, you know, we hope it's something within the Center for Primary Care we can explore. Imagine connecting this with, um, you know, social prescribing where we ask our patients whether loneliness is an issue for them, particularly say older patients we know might be vulnerable. And I am very confident it will not only reduce cost, but it will increase longevity. They will live longer. They will enjoy their life more. And so it's about this kind of balance of not just having an increased, you know, an improved care model, but an operating model that brings it into the community and then to be able to have a business model that sustains it and we all win. So with that, I think we're, we're gonna wrap up here. I'll just leave you um, last slide or two, Louisa, with the Unlonely Project and what we're trying to address at scale is this combination of awareness and education, but also get people engaged in connection and at every step of the way, allow them to have the support they need. And so it is a tough time, you know, for loneliness and isolation. You know, you may have heard the, the phrase, you know, um, same storm, different boats. So COVID-19, the pandemic is something better navigated by some than others. Um, you know, I feel personally very, fortunate to have navigated it um, as well as I have, um, but not everybody has that level of fortune. It's tied to a lot of privilege I have, you know, to, to have the supports and resources I am, you know, as I said, privileged to have, but it's not true for everyone. So next slide. Not, not to lose track of the fact that for many, particularly those most burdened, that loneliness and the feeling of being unwanted is the most terrible form of poverty and that that impoverishment has other implications whether it's you know um, the society in general thriving and flourishing the you know excessive cost of medical care and other kinds of burdens and not just for older adults think about it in in the in the college campus uh, age cohort the workforce there's loneliness everywhere and this poverty uh, even though it you know you might view it as metaphoric is what saps the personal vitality, the ability to thrive and flourish and, and kind of be who we can be. And that's what health is. It's more than the absence of illness, as I know the folks on this call are well aware. So I'll just leave you with the last thought, you know, um, let's take care of each other. You know, I think being on webinars like this is, is an invitation to think about how we can do that in simple ways. And I think we all have ways that we can do that. Times are tough. It's particularly tough for some. So um, thank you for being so kind in, in your, uh, your attention, you know, for the first part of this talk. Um, you know, wanna, we left plenty of time for any questions, any comments, um, and maybe you can stop sharing the screen, Louisa, so we can see more of each other. <laughs> I'll invite you again, you know, for the Q&A, maybe to come off, uh, come on camera if you like. Um, maybe to get the ball rolling, um, I ask, and I, I hope it's okay, you know, in the audience somewhere is Mark Meredy. I can see Mark's thumbnail speech. I think, Mark, you can toggle yourself off. Thank you. Quick introduction. Mark Meredy is the CEO of DeRote, which is a community-based organization in New York City. Um, been around 70 years. Focus, maybe not. I'll let 45. Mark correct that. How many? 45 years. Yeah, like I said, 45 years. <laughs> And one of the first organizations to really recognize loneliness and isolation as a major health concern for older adults. We're very honored that um, DeRote has been a partner with us on several of our programs. I thought I would just turn it over maybe to Mark for a few minutes of his perspective on what it was like on the pilot side of all of this, and then his perspective on the problem and where programs like this might have benefit as, as others may be thinking about their comments and questions. So over to you, Mark. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate the opportunity to participate and the invitation to listen in and to participate in today's seminar. I think what was really transformational for me personally is that I've spent most of my career in the field of aging. And when I was approached by the search firm, if I was interested in heading up the organization on the Upper West Side of Manhattan that helped to provide opportunities for older adults to remain socially engaged 
and to do so through an intergenerational model, that really resonated with me. Why? Because we've provided housing and food and shelter for older adults through the Older Americans Act um, since 1964. But what nobody was paying attention to was the fact the, of the importance, the critical importance of giving older adults the opportunity to stay remain engaged and connected and the beauty of being able to bring the generations together. So it was a real honor to be able to partner with the Young Only Project and with Jeremy in terms of being a pilot site to be able to take our programming that we have been doing for many, many years, put it through this particular lens, um, and then be able to help contribute to the program model, which is evidence-based, which shows the importance of engagement and the importance of art that people have. I think one of the most powerful things that we have heard from the older adults that we have the privilege to be working with is that they have felt a renewed sense of being, a renewed sense of worth. They felt that they were all of a sudden able to be a part of a much larger community. And from the time that DeRote was founded, our mission has been, is, has been specifically to address the issue of social isolation and loneliness. We haven't always talked about it that way, but at the essence, that is really who we are and what we've been about um, for, for our history. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark, for providing that perspective. Um, you know, it's kind of old home week here for me. I see lots of folks out there. I'm like, I want to reach out and say, well, well, I, you know, um, what do you think about this? Because we've been talking about it. So I just invite um, anybody who's got something to share. It doesn't have to be a question. So um, I'm, see, I get to see all of your squares if you've been kind enough to turn on your on your cameras. So um, any thoughts? I mean, this is very familiar territory to many of you, and I'd, I'd love to give you all a chance to chime in. So Scott, I don't know if we're going to uh, ask people to put questions or their comments in chat or just raise their hand using the hand raising function. Any of it can work. Yeah, I think you're doing a great job. And, and, and I think folks can either raise your hand or if you just want to talk, go for it as though, as though we're in a classroom. So Penny Brill, for instance, has, has, her, has her hand up. Go for it, Penny. Um, I just wanted to say hi to Jeremy because I did a presentation a long time ago where he was at the Arts and Healing Conference. I'm in Pittsburgh Symphony. And I've been doing stuff with music therapists for 20 years. And um, <clears throat> part of what I'm working on right now with a group from Global Leaders Program is figuring out how musicians can address um, all the mental health issues and emotional health issues um, in our communities through music. So it ties in exactly with what you're doing, but um, I just, um, you know, the Sound Health Initiative, there are all these, there are kind of things that are converging around trying to use the arts to help with mental health and regulating emotions and things like that. But um, part of what I'm doing is trying to figure out ways of musicians doing more interactive work with whoever's in their audience so that people feel like they're part of a group. And um, I just, uh, anything you can offer as far as, um, you know, uh, activities in that, area that's kind of my my territory but i just think it, it really helps if we help if we keep each other if, if we're informed about what everybody else is trying to do in this area so i really appreciate what you're offering today thanks penny that very kind of you and and again you know the you're doing terrific work and i know the power of music to activate engage and connect people is really remarkable um i think we all kind of got a charge out of that early in the pandemic, you know, in Italy, opera from the balconies. I mean, it was, you know, the uh, the Rotterdam Symphony Orchestra in Zoom format, you know, is just unbelievable. And, and with this global sense of connection, even beyond the interpersonal, where when you can do something in small groups. So definitely a place for music. Well, so when you're, yeah, when you're bringing up the funding thing, though, I think that's an issue because with sound health and 
National Institutes of Health and things like that. I think there's going to be, especially with what you're doing, it all helps support the 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 move toward getting funding from uh, from the health care community. And I think that's going to be an essential part of how do you keep this going? How do you scale it up? So scaling is very much on our mind. That's why I spent a little bit of time, obviously, Penny, at the end of the talk, you know, and, and I see Russ Phillips out there on the, you know, out there on the horizon. And, you know, Russ, maybe you've got some thoughts. I mean, clearly there's a, a place for, you know, addressing loneliness, social isolation and in, in primary care. What are the things we should be thinking about in order to achieve sustainability? Uh, sorry, just unmuting. Um, <laughs> great question. You know, I think one is to think about how we can incorporate a screening test into primary care and the way we do the PHQ-9, because um, I think it's something that, and, but at the same time, we need to have interventions available. So as we detect loneliness or social isolation, you know, the question is what can we really do about it? I think your work really points to some solutions. Mm -hmm. I was actually gonna ask a question because just yesterday we were in touch with some um, physicians and hospital administrators in rural Colorado, and they talked about social isolation as a huge issue, but in their population, people don't, can't afford to travel and the rurality of their area makes it um, you know, very hard to connect people. And some have um, um, options of connecting through computer, but um, some only through telephone. And I wonder sort of what your experience is in trying to create connections or art programs for people who are really at a distance for one from one another and can only be brought together through technology. You know, I love a great question that's almost like a plant because we have an answer for that, Russ. And I'm going to turn to Louisa Hudson, actually, again, to describe our Reflect and Connect um, program, which is we designed in the pandemic for exactly this scenario for distance connection for people who could do audio only. So, Louisa, maybe you can describe that program, how it went. Yeah, so the Reflect and Connect Calls program, it's very similar to the Creativity Circles, except that it is, it's entirely phone-based. So um, it was designed to be one-on-one -on -one with one facilitator and one participant just over the telephone. Uh, and the facilitator has a script and the participant has a script as well, and they go through this session together. But we also had great um, success, actually, um, Mark with DeRote. Um, they did uh, the pilot recently and actually had up to five participants in a group on a conference call style sort of thing. And that worked really fantastically because um, a lot of the participants afterwards maintained uh, connections after that. So that's definitely, um, it's something that's still in pilot and we just had um, another, uh, another site finish up this month, actually, yeah. Great. So then in terms of just sustainability, Jeremy, I'm sure you've thought about the, you know, some of the data you show on readmissions. You know, if we could actually link that to preventing readmissions to decreasing healthcare costs, then it's really something that could be adopted by health systems as a way to uh, decrease costs or, or by payers uh, as well. So I think that's a really critical linkage. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think anything we can do to take the benefits of these kinds of interventions and kind of interweave them into existing delivery and payment models is going to go faster than if we have to go through the long process of determining value and making them billable services on their own, which is a very steep road for anyone who's tried to introduce, you know, innovative process methodology as a, as a CMS payable. It is achievable, but it takes about a decade. But I think, as, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, if we can say that, okay, a loneliness program reduces hospital readmission rates, you will have an immediate economic incentive around a credible healthcare entity in the community to advertise those programs, to deliver them and to optimize them. So I think those are the kind of creative directions we should be exploring. I see a few other hands up. I see, and I'm sorry, it's iPhone CDC, which I suspect is not on your birth certificate as your name, but. <laughs> Hi, that would be me. I'm Carla Drilikov Canales. Um, thank you. If I can jump in, is this okay to just jump in with Absolutely. the question? Jump. Okay, well, I, I'm really thankful and I apologize for the iPhone. I actually had a doctor's appointment and started the phone call in the cab on the way home. Um, uh, I, um, 
am a Harvard ALI fellow, and I was happy to hear someone who mentioned that um, earlier from Philadelphia, possibly a fellow musician. Um, I'm an opera singer by training, and um, it was actually Dr. Howard Coe who recommended I attend the session today. Um, I'm extremely interested in exactly the work that you're doing, and um, have been asking Dr. Dr. Coe about you know what's going on and and how can I learn more because as a musician. I feel that there's a huge disconnect um, for us musicians or artists who want to be able to provide services that are, let's say, outside of the box. And I hesitate to use the term services, but I, I would say that in my experience as an artist, um, primarily singing the title role in Carmen around the world, mostly internationally, I was extremely lonely. I would finish performances and go back to my hotel room and, um, I always was looking to break that fourth wall and make my, my craft more of a communal experience and shifted away from the traditional paradigm of opera towards other, other ways to do that, particularly in cultural diplomacy settings through the State Department. Um, but I'm a long-winded way to introduce myself and say I, I would love the opportunity to follow up and see um, how I might be able to help in, in any way you see fit with the work you're doing. Lastly, I'll say, I think one of the unique things that happened with the sector, with the art sector prior to COVID, but it's certainly been accelerated now, is that we have a, a surplus of underutilized, underemployed, undervalued in many cases, artists. And yet, as you're pointing out, I think we have a sort of social deficit of many of the intrinsic values that artists naturally bring to the table, whether that's creativity and imagination or discipline and perhaps empathy and compassion. And to me, I, I view that as a sort of army of compassion waiting to be mobilized. I know many of my colleagues feel the way I do um, of a sort of dissatisfaction with the general paradigm, which now is no longer even in existence and a, a strong desire to connect with others. So I hope you won't mind my saying this in, in this time here at a public forum, but I, I would really love to follow up and see if there's any way that myself or any of the artists I know um, could contribute to the work that you're doing. Thank you for your comment. I mean, in terms of following up, absolutely. We're eager to follow up with anyone who found this talk interesting. To make it a little easier, I put my email in the chat um, so you can see it there. And again, please, anyone here, email me. Just a couple of comments on some of the things you brought up. First of all, artists we work with are very um, eager to be part of these processes. There's a growing movement Again, I won't go too deep into it because not everyone is probably interested in, in teaching artists being involved in community health activities. So um, they could easily be facilitators of the types of programs Louisa described with minimal training. And I'm talking three hours <laughs> and, and deliver safe, effective, high impact programs. It's a, it's a version of what, um, you know, um, <clears throat> Dr. Phillips and others know as community health workers, you know, recognizing that, you know, there's a broad array of skills and capabilities that can be harnessed to deliver health in community settings. So I think there is a role for artists. In terms of the, um, the challenges of loneliness and isolation in art itself, that's another very important area. Um, I, you know, I've gotten to know and work with a, another opera singer you probably know, she's well known, Renee Fleming through her work in art in um, brain and health. And she's yes. been very supportive of unpacking what goes on in performance and mm -hmm. anxiety and stress, uh, as, but also the flip side, how certain creative work can reduce anxiety and distress. So we're happy to follow up, you know, and, um, and, and get to know you and your work and interest better. And that, that's for anybody on this call. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. I, I see a hand raised by Mitchell Weiss, which gives me great joy. Go ahead, Dr. Weiss. Jeremy, it's great to see you and uh, to hear about what you're doing after many, many years and decades. I have uh, uh, two questions, one of them more general about um, the film aspect of, of what you've been doing. It's an area I've been interested in for a long time um, in connection with using films for mental health and involving communities. And I'm curious, I, and I thought that that uh, animation that 
that we, that your show was was really terrific. I'm I'm curious to hear how um, how you do the work with films, whether you have the people participating, creating films, or are they reacting to films, uh, and how they're doing that. And the second question that I have is 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 more personal in in that. Um, I remember when we were in medical school together and you were a, a poet, you wrote this wonderful poem on, on pain. And I'm curious if you have one on loneliness. Yeah, I'll take that second question first, which it, for, that's kind of amazing you remember that poem. And, uh, and I do have a poem on loneliness and I'd be happy to send it to you. In fact, I'll send it to anyone who sends me an email and asks for it. To your first question, um, you know, it really, the film activity has been remarkable. We, we curate the films, not I say we, but it's, it's a group activity, but it's led by our film curator, Natalie G. And Natalie is a filmmaker herself and she curates for the Brooklyn Film Festival and others. And there are an enormous number of short films out there. It, and you know, she must look at 800, 900 films a season for us and then brings a hundred or so together for us to look at as a curatorial group. So most of the films in the film festival, we actually invite um, uh, the filmmakers to submit. We have a growing presence in the filmmaker community though. So as people see what we're trying to do with the films, they respond. So that's how we get the films. We aren't producing our own films at this point, although we have made films. So on our website, if anyone's interested is a seven minute short on um, can art be medicine. So we do appreciate the power of film both to simulate thoughts and conversations, but also to communicate what we're up to. How the films actually work in the dynamic environment of say um, a group support setting or even um, people you know, in family settings watching it has been very, very encouraging. You know, we've had people call say, you know, I've been having trouble communicating with my you know, um, child. We saw your films, we watched it together and had a conversation that otherwise we wouldn't have had. So, I mean, that's why we put them out there so they can be screened for free, you know, so that people in a variety of settings can put them to work to really get conversations started. Yeah. So, you know, so that's, and again, you know, uh, Mitchell, emails in, in, the, in the chat, I'd love to follow up with you if that's interesting. Sure, sure. Um, maybe I'll just mention that um, with regard to the films, what, what we have been, I was working, I have been working with a group in, uh, in Chennai in India uh, SCARF, the Schizophrenia Research Foundation. And since 2008, we've had a film festival with the idea of using feature films and commentators of filmmakers and mental health professionals involving audience participation, as well as a competition for five minutes or less short films. And uh, we give awards to uh, those who can uh, submit something, and then we use those for the basis of discussion. Yeah, well, very yeah. similar model. And yeah. and by the way, would be would love to have those filmmakers submit those short films to our film festival. We actually have cash awards. We have national, international acclaim. I mean, so if there's a fit, we'll make sure we you have the submitter link. We're just about. I think we are closed for this season. And by the way, for those who want to keep an eye out. Uh, June 6th, we launched the fifth annual Unlonely Film Festival with an evening of activity. Um, Renee Fleming will probably be there. She was there last year with her bit of testimonial. Um, you know, so it's right around the corner. And again, anyone who sends uh, me an email will get an invitation. We're, we're down to just a couple of minutes. I, you know, I, I didn't want to, I don't want to overstay our welcome. Scott, do we have time for one more question or maybe you have one? Sure. I I meant to raise my hand, I clapped, which I would clap anyway. Um, but have, um, as you're doing your work, which is, sounds really remarkable, art is such an interesting bounded term. The, 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 the batteries do get a little fuzzy. So for instance, on the experience of art, you talk about going to a museum, how does that differ, say, than watching interesting television or listening to interesting music? And so as far as the activities that you encourage, you know, painting and dance and poetry, do people do blogging or nonfiction or historical writing or other, other things that may fill those same kind of buckets? Yeah, it's a great question. And so I'll give a simple answer just because time is relatively short. But as I said in my talk, Scott, all the arts work, but they don't all work for everybody. 
which is one of the reasons why the randomized controlled trials about creative expression and have been so tough because some people get totally activated in uh, journaling and free writing. Like Scott Pennebaker writes a lot about that. He's, you know, he's a psychologist, but he'll often have interventions. He'll run the same intervention with a different group and it won't work. You know, you, you know, so if you do a randomized trial to somebody, you know, who doesn't get energized around writing and you assign them writing prompts and writing tasks, it's not gonna activate them. And so part of this is educating people to the point where they can navigate their own way to the creative work that is, that they're drawn to. I'm personally drawn to poetry. I mean, I, you know, since I was like five, I can't explain it, but I think many people resonate with that. So a big part of addressing this at a community level is to making sure that there are options for almost any art in its collaborative, fun way, because it is fun. I mean, art making is, what's a classic, it's called autotelic behavior. It's self-rewarding, self-reinforcing. You know, you don't have to like bribe kids typically to do finger painting, you know, they just do it. And so we've had that same experience. If you invite people in and set the stage, they engage with the work. Okay, well, thank you for engaging with us. This was great, both you and Louisa. Th thank you sincerely. Um, obviously everyone has um, Jeremy's email and, and really super grateful for this. Um, Medicine, certainly art and science. And, and so next week for the Pro Star Seminar, I want to let everyone know that Matt Bonds uh, will be speaking on combining science and social justice for a model system of community-based universal, universal health coverage in Madagascar uh, with discussion afterwards by Tahiri Ravelasan. Uh, obviously, you're all welcome to, to join us for next week. And again, thank you to both Jeremy and, and Lisa to, and to all of you for participating. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, David. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you today. Stay safe, stay connected, stay creative, and we look forward to staying in touch with all of you.